Welcome back everybody to another episode of Bikes and Bourbon. I'm Russ from Pathless Pedal. I'm Toffer from Pedal Missoula. And today we have a special guest. Which... I'm... <laughs> Daniel! <laughs> Daniel! <laughs> from Tumbleweed Bikes. Tumbleweed Bikes. And Daniel, being the awesome guest he is, has brought something nice for today's Bikes and Bourbon. Yep. You want to tell yep. us a little bit about it? Uh, this is my favorite whiskey from San Francisco. Um, Anchor Distilling Company. This is the um, Old Potrero Straight Rye Single Malt Whiskey. And uh, you too, you know, if you want to be on the show, you can... <laughs> <laughs> that, you, don't, you don't have to bring a nice whiskey, but ch but chances the the chances it'll end up on the YouTube channel are greatly increased. <laughs> it's a rye, it's a rye. So that means the mash bill is at least fifty one percent. Well, cheers, welcome to Missoula. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Got your rye notes. Yeah, it's spicy. It's spicy like you would expect from a rye. Uh, we were talking earlier. I get kind of like cinnamon red hots. <laughs> Russ's tasting notes. Uh, <laughs> I, sometimes they're not your typical what maybe uh, just whiskey sommelier like, might point out. It just reminds me but, of can, candy of my youth. <laughs> what I like about it, though for a rye is that it's just like that. Even that first sip is smooth. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not like it. The, the spice doesn't like. Yeah. It's spicy, but it's not like a like a barrel fire in your tongue, like yeah. uh, like the Tattersall. I think I measure all the rye that we drink now compared to the because yeah, it, it had some some kick to it. Yeah, not alcohol kick, but spice kick. Right. Uh, this episode, we're gonna talk about uh, tumbleweed, why you started the company, a little bit about the the bike, the prospector, in case you know some folks at home aren't familiar. So I guess just tell us um, you know about the company and, and about the bike. Yeah, well, big, I, big picture. Yes, big picture. So, uh, I started Tumbleweed Bikes about four years ago, um, sort of with the idea of creating um, expedition mountain touring bikes. So, um, bikes designed for loaded riding on dirt trails and single track mountain bike kind of stuff. I built up a lot of bikes um, to do these kind of trips um, leading up to starting Tumbleweed, and there was always something about Either the, you know, there was always some kind of compromise with the bikes that I'd yeah. um, built up. And so I wanted to really um, design a bike that got rid of as many of those. Like what, what were some of the quirks that you saw in, in bikes that you, you tried to, to make work for that purpose? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the bikes that I tried, um, you know, bikes that are sort of expedition bikes, fat bikes, plus bikes that had, you know, like horizontal track dropouts that were annoying so you had to sort of position the wheel exactly perfectly in a line right. of brake rotor um, or like on some of the bikes you have to remove the brake caliper <laughs> itself just to take off the wheel. Wow. Um, and I'm coming at this from a, um, a roll-off perspective. I've been right. a big fan of the 14-speed roll-off hubs for almost a decade now and so mm -hmm. I sort of, my frame of reference for me is with that particular drivetrain mm -hmm. um, and sort of adapting maybe bikes that were designed with derailers primarily in mind, but maybe we're roll off compatible. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to make a bike that would still work with derailers, you know, they're derailer compatible, right? <laughs> like, more, like, more like roll off optimized and right, something yeah. that, you know, from the user perspective, from the end user, end user um, a bike that would just work seamlessly, you know, whether you're um, packing it up in a box hurriedly or, mm -hmm. um, you know, out on a big tour and you don't want to worry about your bike tipping over and bending your derailleur or yeah. getting 10 pounds of mud kicked up in the wheels. So what's the what's wheel size on the on the Prospector? So I'd originally designed the Prospector to work with 26 by four or 29 by three mm -hmm. wheels. And I sort of, I designed a few um, custom parts on the frame specifically to work with those two wheel formats. Um, but what's actually become the most common wheel size is the 27.5 plus, which mm -hmm. is Sort of right in between the two, you know, the 26.4 and the 29 by three. Right. Um, Do you think that's because like people see the extremes and want to split in between? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've had I've had a couple people order, you know, two wheel sets because the bike is sort of built around um, a number of different rim and tire combination possibilities. With like a 26 inch, do people go fatter than like than three inch? 
Yeah. So and then if they go 29, do they go skinnier? Yeah. So generally, that's kind of maybe the philosophy yeah. that people. Yeah. So the 26 by four and the 27 five by three and a 29 by two and a quarter all share the similar outer diameter. <laughs> that yeah, sounds like math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah. basically, so, yeah. Okay, so the frame yeah. is designed to basically just have maximum tire clearance around the roll off. So right. we basically designed it the bike around that drivetrain as opposed to around a specific gotcha. wheel size. So sure. it's built around a wheel diameter, huh. and then um, you can run basically all those combinations of wheels because it, they all fit in the same wheel diameter. So right. um, yeah, so that's sort of the, cool. the trick. Um, but the bike is built around a Phil Wood eccentric bottom bracket, mm -hmm. so you mm -hmm. actually get a half an inch of up and down bottom bracket adjustment. Oh, sure. So, sure. so depending on where you're riding, if right. you're just gonna be doing you know, dirt road tours, um, you know, long stretches of, right. you know, non-technical stuff. You can run the bottom bracket low and you're sort of riding in the bike and it's yeah. more stable. And then if you, if you put a suspension fork on the bike, you can bump up the bottom bracket and gives you a little bit more pedal clearance. Sure. Right. Rides more like a trail bike. Yeah. So, so you, you, you started the company, you have the bike, like what are, what are, what's like been the hardest thing about running the company? Um, well, I mean, the hardest thing for me personally is is it managing the large staff? The large yeah. staff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the personnel. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I mean, I started this company as a side project, working full time as a bike mechanic. So, right. I mean, even up until three months ago, I was still working a regular bike mechanic gig right. job. So I've tried to basically start the company um, with as little debt as possible, and yeah. um, kind of just grow it organically, and um, yeah, and sort of bootstrap it. And so I've you know, was working for, you know, I'd work eight hour shift at a bike shop and then I would work another six hour shift like in a catering kitchen doing food prep until right. like three in the morning. And it was just like scraping together all the money you can right. just to like afford to make the first prototype frame or, right. you know, the samples and, and so, you know, just that's, going that's to living bed. the dream, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just going to bed at night, like, you know, after working so much and you're just wondering like, oh man, is anybody even going to like care about, right. yeah. you know, about these bikes? So um, what was it like when you got your first shipment of like production bikes after like all the, all the, the work and yeah. investment? I mean, the, the first thing I just like ripped open the box and I was just like, <laughs> is everything where it's supposed to be? Um, Cause you go through so many, you go through these iterations of, um, of the design process and you know you get all these drawings these technical drawings back right and it's just you know there's so many lines and details on them and um you know you're just praying that you know everything's where it's supposed right. to be that you didn't <laughs> overlook something and um yeah. So that was probably the. But every, everybody part. saved the right version. Yeah. Everybody, exactly. Everybody's on yeah. the same page, yeah. like literally yeah. as the most recent version of the exactly. of, the, of the drawing. Yeah. So um, did, did you do any like ceremonial opening, or was it literally just like? No, it was literally like there was a. You know, I was running the shop basically out of my garage, and um, this you know the semi truck pulls out in the middle of our street, and I had like eight guys, eight of my buddies, like frantically pulling all the boxes out of this out of this truck you know right. trying to clear traffic from our street and yeah and so i just grabbed like the first box that i, I saw don't care which it one up. it is yeah i was just making That's sure awesome. that it was all good so um, awesome. that was a big moment though that was i mean three years basically of um work and development to get a finished production product yeah and, right um and thankfully everything turned out great and you know, I'm really happy with, with the bikes and I've gotten a lot of great feedback from customers and um, just right now in the process of um, getting the second round of frames ordered. Cool. So yeah, it's been, I've had, I tried to keep very low expectations about the company <laughs> and you know, so far it's, you know, they've been met. So right. it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been a really great learning experience and um, had a lot of help from, from really great people too. So yeah. Um, so you, you're a small operation, and I know that recently I saw on Porcelain Rockets, Instagram, Interwebs abilities, that they have a frame bag that is compact. I mean, it's designed around. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, yep. there's like tumbleweed yep. branding on tumbleweed it. Tumbleweed logo on there. Um, yep. And was that a conscious effort to go with another kind of small, Shop. The story with that is I've known Scott for a long time. He he and I actually rode the Great Divide mountain bike route back in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, 
back when I, I had just left Rivendell and he was, we actually met, we were going the opposite direction and we just bumped into each other randomly at like one point yeah. and didn't, and you know, didn't really think right. much about it. But then yeah. my friend Cass Gilbert, um, you know, he had been doing some stuff with Scott and, and he was like, oh yeah, Scott remembers you, he met you on the yeah. <laughs> And so, um, and so we've kind of kept in touch and he's made right. me a bunch of bags over the years and, mm -hmm. um, and then it was just recently in the last few months that um, I reached out to him to see if he would be willing to do a run of custom sized frame bags, um, mm -hmm. the, his waterproof 52 hertz yeah. bags. Yeah. This stuff is so great. I mean, he's so right. innovative. All of the right. you know mm -hmm. the seat bags and Mr. Fusion and yeah, um, yeah the yeah. Orbiter, like all, he just is constantly creating all these really cool new kind of right. I mean, as designs. you described how you built the Prospector, I mean, it seems like that's what Scott was trying to do with porcelain rocket bags. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that type of thing where like when you're out there, you can't have like your zipper break, you can't yeah. have, <laughs> yeah. um, you want it to be waterproof because you don't know, mm -hmm. like you can, you're not gonna be able to like just hang out at a five star hotel while your stuff right. dries. <laughs> right. Like you need yeah. everything to be like self-sustained self right. right. in your, on your bike, on your setup and so. Yep. Yeah, I mean the quality is just great and I'm really, I'm. You know, for me, it's like I want quality first, and I want to make sure everything functions properly, and not so much trying to hit like price point. It's just like I want everything to be as good as it possibly can yeah. be, and sort of with a, with as few compromises as possible. And right. um, I feel like Scott does a similar kind of thing with his sure. with his bags. You used to work at Rivendell. Like, what were some of the things that you you learned from your time there? Um, that was a that was sort of my first real. Um, job in the bike industry. I worked there from 2005 to 2008. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because it feels more like a family than a business. Right. You know, it's a small company and there's, right. I think right now there's probably 13 people or so that work there. Yeah. Um, and people are really loyal to, to Grant and to the company in general. Mm -hmm. But I definitely learned sort of, you know, just seeing how Grant treated customers. Um, I thought that was really important you know the fact that he was willing to you know sit down and talk to people who came by and yeah. you know answer all their questions and right. be really friendly and want right. to know more about the people um but also you know just grants um he doesn't want to follow what just blindly follow what you know the rest of the industry is doing he has right. an idea of what he wants for his bikes right yep. and he wants to see that vision through and he's willing to mm -hmm. you know Make sacrifices and spend spend money to <laughs> right. you know, do that. Um, well, it also yeah. seems like when you, I mean, as a customer or as just like an outside observer, I think not as a customer. <laughs> I wish I, you know, <laughs> I would like a Rivendell, but um, but as an outside observer or maybe a potential customer, you know, you see that, and I think about a company, and I'm like, um, I guess I would like like you were saying before, like doing something well, mm -hmm. and like knowing that somebody has like a reason mm -hmm. for why they're, why they're sticking with something. Yeah, and it's right. not just like, <laughs> well, this new, uh, this new thing has become standard. Uh, you know, it's like becoming right. the standard. And so right. we have this type of geometry that we're gonna like try to like mm -hmm. kind of fit this thing on now because that's what is just happening in the bike industry. Right. Right. And I kind of like the idea that you go to somebody and it's like, yeah, we, yeah, we could do that. But like, we know, like we know how to do that. Yeah. Like, we, it's not like we're un uncapable of doing the math right. to figure out how that would work. We yeah. just are like, we don't believe that that's what you need. Right. Right. And yeah. like, exactly. You, you can disagree. With, yeah. Like you can disagree yeah. with us, but like, right. we think this is perfectly valid and right. yeah. uh, it has a long history. It's worked great. <laughs> yeah. I'm naturally a skeptic of new new technology yeah, and I yeah. hate to like label myself as a curmudgeon because I don't right. feel like I'm like, you know, but um, I'm skeptical about, about new stuff and I kind of like to wait for stuff to get kind of sorted out and especially yeah. with, you know, like new axle standards and headset standards and right. bottom bracket standards and all the things that kind of just seem to be changing so fast. And so, you know, it took me a long time to actually get my first roll-up hub. It was, right. you know, they're expensive and I did a lot of hand wringing. It's right. like, oh, should I, should I get this? And then I finally got one and, you know, ever since then it's like, you know, you use it and you right. put it through its trials and it actually works great. And, right. Right. you know, I use one now for just daily commuting and yeah. it also just happens to work great for, you know, my... That's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 
you can use it for expeditions or whatever. Yeah. It's just a super reliable, non-racing kind of that's piece the, of it. Yeah, that seems like... I mean, like, mm. I've been a mechanic for a long time, and I work on other people's bikes, and so I'm just... I just see, like, these filthy drivetrains come in, <laughs> and I'm fixing other people's bikes all day, and I, <coughs> I'm horrible with my own bike maintenance. <laughs> and I'm just like, I just want a bike that I can just... I know I can just ride any time right. and not have to worry about if, like... You know, the worst that's, thing that happens to my bike is, like, the chain gets squeaky, and, yeah. like... You know that's it. You know, yeah. so or yeah. occasionally replace the brake pads, but yeah. it's nice to just know that you have something that is super. It's just always going to work. Right. So like one of the, like I'm kind of like a armchair, you know, bike designer nerd, <laughs> and I have ideas, but like not you know putting them <laughs> into practice. And I'm always fascinated by by things that seem like, you know, relatively simple, like maybe mm -hmm. to the untrained eye, but has all sorts of complexity. So what's what's this thing? <laughs> yeah. So this is the. Um, this is one of the pieces that make um, the tumbleweed, the prospector is kind of as versatile as it is that allows it to work with the different wheel and tire combinations. Um, so this is the bottom bracket yoke. I had an original um, CNC machined um, mm -hmm. yoke design and cut that we used for the original prototype prospectors, but this is cast. Um, Anna Schwinn helped me do the design on this. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the piece that basically, um, you know, this area right here, this is where the, the chain rings yeah. and mm -hmm. the chain are. This is a super tight fit right here, sort of to have a reasonable chain stay length and right. also fit. Um, you know, the crank set and the chain and these yeah. big tires. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like that much. Just <laughs> it looks here. like a Y. You know, it looks like, it looks like a sling, slingshot. Yeah. It's like a slingshot, <laughs> yeah. But this is basically the piece that... The most um, expensive slingshot ever. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, this is the basically the piece that lets everything work together properly. Oh. And this was a huge undertaking. Um, the, the original batch of frames is actually... Um, there was a delay because it was so difficult for the for the factory to do the casting on this piece because it's so long and skinny mm -hmm. and hollow. Um, there was yeah. a, a high defect rate um, when they were first making these, so the you know it took they had to go back and yeah. you know redo their process a right. few times in order to get it so they could actually do a, get a production run of these things mm -hmm. made for the right. for the bike. So. So was that something you expected or was it like, whoa? <laughs> I knew it was gonna be challenging, but it's yeah. one of the things that I really insisted on on doing. Um, yeah. It's a it's a really kind of neat piece and it's got, you know, the, the logo um, cast into it and mm -hmm. the tumbleweed name. Mm -hmm. I could have gone with like a, you know, I could have done a cheaper way, you know, with a, a bent plate, yeah. but it's just not as elegant. Once again, it gets painted over. Mm -hmm. It's like in a part of the bike that people like really never Right. Examine. You're not like, you're not like yeah. staring at it yeah. all you know, day. But yeah. for, for, yeah. for a piece that people like probably don't realize, I mean, it does so much work to make yeah. the rest of the bike function. Exactly. So yeah. that's. Yeah. And to do it right, you know, I wanted to, I didn't, I wasn't trying to get, you know, the shortest chain stays ever. You know, I don't think that having the world's shortest chain stay is necessarily <laughs> A, a big benefit for the kind of riding that you know I designed the bike for, yeah, but having right. a reasonable length that would still be sporty and right. you know. How not, long are those days? They're 4.58. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, which is sort of a good, you know, a lot of, I have a, a couple of other mountain touring bikes that are around 4.65 or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it's long compared to a, like a racing mountain bike, but right. um, you know, compared to other touring bikes right. and yeah. you know, other off-road yeah. kind of expedition bikes, it's pretty pretty reasonable. Right. Yeah. The whole design process, I wanted it to benefit the end user primarily. I, yeah. You know, I went to lengths to make the manufacturing process more complicated and expensive. <laughs> right. To make the whole user end user experience easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, it's all external cable routing. Right. Yeah, vertical dropouts, roll-off specific dropout. So um, that was kind of the the main end goal. So I'm, I'm really curious about like the eccentric bottom bracket. Could you just mess around with that for for fun, just for like to change ride di dynamics? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've, I've changed it in the you know on the trail. It literally takes about thirty seconds to adjust the height, and it's nice because you don't have to deal with the the design. Phil Wood basically made this this eccentric just for me and they even laser etched my logo into <laughs> oh, the wow. polished aluminum um, insert wow. so yeah nice um so it doesn't use any wedges or bolts or anything like that which right all those extra interfaces are can make things creak and right yeah get for stuck and things like that so yeah. this is a really simple design that um you know it you basically just undo two bolts two big beefy machine screws right. um, on the underside and then it's a six millimeter allen wrench and you can just right. rotate, rotate the eccentric. It's super simple. Right. So I can I can understand like uh, lowering it 
you, you feel more in the bike, feels more stable. Like, what's the like if you crank it up to its, its mm -hmm. highest setting? Like, what's what's the ride feel? Um, I feel like it still rides great. The main, I mean, the main benefit is just basically that pedal clearance. Okay. Like, if you're yeah. riding on real rocky trails, like right. I, I took the one of the prototype bikes, I put a RockShox Pluto fork on it, yeah. and I put fat <laughs> tires. I put my fat bike wheel set on it, and I did yeah. the Downeyville uh, downhill course on it, oh, and. Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely raised it in the right. high position just to get as much you know pedal clearance as possible. But um, yeah, it's a bike that I mean, it's heavier than you know a carbon bike or an aluminum bike or right. you know right. other bikes that are primarily focused on weight. But it's not that much heavier, and it right. it still rides like a mountain bike, and right. you know you can still take it on those kind of rides. Right. Or Pel Missoula showing El Silencio on mm -hmm. Friday. Uh, we interviewed Jay. Yep, that was a great, that was a good interview on PLP Talk. So we heard his side of the story, like what? <laughs> well, so, but, but, yeah, and like you've done. I mean, I think, I think these movies were maybe the way that I was first introduced to mm -hmm. tumbleweed. I mean, yeah. And so what? What made you decide to go with that kind of that cinematic, that film, you know, that this route of yeah. making movies kind of connected to the brand? Yeah, I mean, first of all, like I. Started. I designed this bike because I have already been doing these kind of long trips anyway, and so yeah. I wanted to keep, you know, I, I started the company, A, because I wanted to make a product that I like, but also mm -hmm. because I wanted to be able to keep doing these kind of trips. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I didn't want to do, you know, I didn't really want to have like a bunch of, you know, fake polished, right. you know, promo <laughs> photos and stuff. I was like, let's just like Go use the stuff, sure. do the trips, and, um, Jay had worked with me, uh, actually we just kind of, he came in right as I was leaving for the Great Divide, mm -hmm. um, but we've been friends for a long time and I'd seen some of the video stuff that he'd done and um, I thought it was great. He's just, mm -hmm. his style is really kind of hands off, observational kind of stuff. And, right. Um, and the first trip we went to uh, Mongolia and made that first film, it was, um, you know, it was just him and that camera. And, <laughs> I mean, he had like, it was just literally just him doing all the photo stuff with his yeah. camera. And I, I was just blown away when I saw the, when yeah. I saw the movie and what he was able to do and just right. his style. Yeah. And so, um, you know, when it was time to do this Peru trip, you know, we got a little bit better, you know, equipment. We got a drone. And right. Like that. So, um, and I think he just did, he's just such, mm -hmm. you know, you can have whatever fancy equipment you want, but I think Jay yeah. has such a great, um, creative mind and yeah. his style is so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so was it, was there like was there much like directing during the thing, or was it pretty much flat on the wall? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, there was a few things where it was like you know we need to get um, you know we need to get some just some riding shots where he would sort of run backwards you know up a hill. Right. And we, would, we would be pedaling up this really <laughs> steep kind of yeah. technical <laughs> section trying yeah. to get get a shot, but it wasn't really like scripted. It wasn't like here's what I want you to say. It was right. more like. Hey, we're gonna go into this restaurant. You know, I'm just gonna go with the flow, and we'll just see what happens. Yeah. And right. So, kind of capturing kind of like natural interactions with people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can totally appreciate that because it's you can't be completely like uh, flying the wall because you need yeah. certain scenes for for the thing to make right. sense. Yeah. You know, just for like narrative continuity. So it's this this balance between you know getting the, the stuff you need to tell the story, mm -hmm. but not. But not like over directing that it kind of changes right. like the right. narrative. Right, that steep section for the tenth time. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were obviously some parts where it's like, hey, we're about to do this like huge switchback climb, you know, up the right. last like thousand yeah. feet. Yeah. yeah, he's like, wait here for ten minutes while you have the drone. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was, you know, that was kind of set up, but it was we were gonna ride that stuff anyway. So yeah. Right. yeah. Um, so you uh, did an initial film tour. How how'd that go? It was really good. Yeah, we had I think we had six different. Um, events starting in LA um, at Golden Saddle Cyclery and kind of had a few, you know, little, had a little bit of a learning curve. Yeah, some like <laughs> some sound issues, but right. um, by the end in, in Seattle, it was it was really great. And we had great turnout from people and um, we had two Bay Area shows, um, kind of hometown crowd. And we yeah. did a show at the Maroon Mountain Bike Museum, which was really awesome. We had just all the, you know, the legends of yeah. you know, old school mountain biking. And, um, yeah, it was it was an awesome, awesome uh, event. So, um, but we're, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I wish, I wish Jay and Pepper could be here for this. Right. But, you know, this is yeah. kind of a spur of the moment thing. And I was really yeah. glad that you invited me to. Yeah, how did it come about? You're like. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, somebody asked, like, you know, when is it going to be showing in my, you know, insert town here. Yeah. And it's like, um, I think. I the magic 
the thing was fly fishing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> asking nicely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, we kind of just worked it out. It was like, because I think definitely I saw, I mean, I think living in Montana, I, we have like a lot of great things here, but we're also, it's not the easiest place to get to. I want movies like this to be in Missoula. Like, yeah. I want this conversation to be happening here too. Yeah. Right. Um, because, yeah, we can kind of be out here, but then there's a lot of cool things to do here. So I, we, I, we have to import some bikey things. <laughs> Sometimes it has to be imported. Yeah. Uh, whether so it's like <laughs> movies or bourbon, yeah, right. like, like, yeah. Yeah. risky. Yeah, we import it here yeah. uh, sometimes. <laughs> but yeah. well, I was excited. I was excited to get that invitation. I mean, Montana is awesome. Like I, I yeah. love. I mean, I rode through the whole state on the Great Divide. And yeah. It was one of my favorite favorite yeah. places. And um, yeah, I'm always down to have an excuse to come back and <laughs> yeah. visit. Um, and also just, it's fun to do these events and like bring people together and have people right. meet up face to face. Yeah. And you know, eventually the Esalen So movie will be online for everybody yeah. to see. But yeah. I wanted to, I want to kind of like stretch it out a little bit and just kind of get as many of these kind of in-person events as possible. Cause it's yeah. just right. so cool to have everybody show up and. Right. So I'm gonna do one reader question. I think we covered the, the Gates thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so bike from Bike Touring News, assuming they don't plan to run 26 by 4 tire roll-off combo, why should someone buy a Prospector over a Surly ECR or similar plus tire touring bike? Well, ECR is a good bike, absolutely, yeah. and it's definitely, I had one of those and I thought it was a, I thought it was really great. Um, I guess the main difference is um, the vertical dropouts versus the ECR has the sort of sliding yep. track dropout, yep. so it's just mainly ease of use. You know, taking the wheel on and off, aligning right. the aligning the brakes. Yeah. You know, and that might not be a big deal for someone who is on a budget and wants a great bike for right. not a ton of money. Um, but you know, that's it's all those kind of little things that I you know bikes that I've used and wanted to sort of make you know in my mind sort of a better user experience. Right. Um, so that vertical dropout, um, also the the eccentric bottom bracket that we already talked about, giving yeah. you. Um, the ability to adjust the chain height up and down, even if you're not going to run a roll off, if you want to run a single speed, you, right. know, you can That's still tension yeah. the chain yeah. a lot easier than having to, you know, make sure the wheel is just in the right position. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, then also just the extra tire clearance. Even if you aren't running a roll off, you know, there's mm -hmm. more. There, this is the maximum amount of tire clearance that will fit right. with most standard cranks. Um, right. There's like two and a half or three millimeters of clearance between the crank arm and the and the chain stay. So. Yeah. Um, I really like maximize. Yeah. So, I like spent a lot more money like to have the frames made just to really be able to maximize. Yeah. Um, so it's just me and you. Hashtag clearance is everything. Yeah. <laughs> it, clearance is free. You know. It's like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the ECR is a great bike, and there's so many no, great yeah. bikes out there that yeah. do this kind of stuff. Right. And you know, I just can't, I approach this from an angle of, you know, what if I I, I wanted to put my name on something that I was right. really proud of, and that was kind of something that. I personally would order as like a custom bike for myself mm -hmm. right. and it ended up being so expensive you know it's like they have the yoke made to do um, the dropouts that I had made it's like to do all the stuff that I really wanted to do it's yeah. like the only really the real way to do it is just to have a production run made so I was like right. okay fine <laughs> I'll do it and hopefully hopefully there's a few other people out there who are like okay I can see the value in these right. you know design attributes and yeah. you know and so far you know it's been you know there's been people that have Felt that well, way, and yeah. I, mean, I remember when I was first getting into like steel bikes and mm -hmm. kind of thinking about not just get, going to like uh, the big bike shop in my town, but kind of mm -hmm. wanting to know more about what I was getting into. And I remember yeah. reading an interview with Graham where he mm -hmm. was like, "Yeah, like if you can't afford a Rivendale, like a Surly totally is like a really <laughs> good bike for you. Yeah. Um, like our bikes have some different things that we've mm -hmm. like really thought about yeah. that like." Yeah that's because we're making this more kind of right. thing but like this yeah. other bike is like yeah. <laughs> we're not doing <laughs> this because we think these other ones just suck totally we're Absolutely. doing it because we have preferences yeah. and yeah. we care about this so much yeah. that we're gonna like bring those preferences into the world Absolutely. in this in this yeah. form but yeah. like yeah. if that's not like you might not either that might not make sense to you mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> or you just can't afford it or you're whatever reason like yeah. you, you want absolutely so and honestly like surly if it wasn't for surly like there's so many like cool 
bikes and cool scanners that wouldn't exist. I right. mean, like, if it wasn't for the Pugsley, like, yeah. that bikes wouldn't exist. If it wasn't for the Krampus, like, I, you know, I rode a Krampus, the first, the, that bass boat green one. Yeah. <laughs> that was such an awesome bike. Like, I love that bike. Like, the only, and the only thing I didn't like about it was, like, you know, using the roll off, you know, because yeah. you had to remove the brake caliper to take the wheel off. But, I mean, that is such a fun bike to ride. Yeah. And, like, yeah. I mean, Cerulean's done so much awesome stuff, like, the long haul trucker like yeah you know they've entered, they've made these great bikes that are yeah. affordable for people and i mean just man i mean if it wasn't for them the, the bike world would be a lot different yeah so. it'd be pretty boring yeah, <laughs> yeah. i've always you know i've been a big it's not a bike world. for a long time yeah. not a bike yeah. world i want to live in yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> where, where do you see uh tumbleweed going in the future other models or just kind of refining the prospector yeah i mean i think um, I'm always tinkering with stuff, so I think, yeah. um, you know, every round of prospectors is going to be a little bit different. There's going to be little tweaks here and there. I mean, most people, it might be stuff that's minor enough that most people won't even notice, but right. for me, it's like, you know, I build up every one of these bikes by my by myself, and I build yeah. all the wheels, and I do, you know, every single one. It's like, I'm, I have a lot of hands-on time with each <laughs> of these builds, and so... Yeah. Um, there's always little things that I notice. I'm like, oh, I wonder how that would be if I move this brace on five millimeters here right. or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I think that's going to continue to evolve. But I think um, the focus of the brand is definitely going to still be on, you know, kind of dirt, um, dirt touring bikes. Yeah. And, you know, there might be other kind of variations. Right. You know, other styles of bikes that fit within that, that role. But, right. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, bikes that I want to ride. I, I don't mind staying small. Like, I'm just a one-man right. operation, but I just want to make bikes that I that I like to ride. Uh, well, so what's, uh, what do you think on the ride? It gets, so one of the things that I have found about, like, a good whiskey, so rye, bourbon, mm -hmm. all of our variations in here, one of the things, like, I really like about, like, a good one to me is that it does this thing simultaneously, like, paradoxically, going to the background and not necessarily standing out, but also giving you enough where you're like, oh, that's good. Oh, that's like you, you kind of, yeah. yeah, like you yeah. kind of get yeah. a little bit of flavor, you know, where it you're just like- a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. where yeah. you're like, oh, that's good. But then you're not also like being just like, every time I drink this, I'm like getting something. <laughs> yeah. And so this is like one of those things where like, this has been like really enjoyable just to yeah. like sip and hang out and talk uh, but but, bikes, doesn't, but, doesn't, but but it's not boring like all throughout. There's no, no, like, that's yeah. the thing is that, yeah, like I feel like if you wanted to like, pay more attention to it, yeah. it would hold up to that. Right. But also if you just wanted to do this or, yeah. you know. Yeah. And actually though, saying that, I don't know if I would want to take it in a flask. Mm. I think it deserves a glass. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I feel is, like this, yeah. like having it, you know, like the, the aroma is focused in the right way, gives you the full experience, yeah. you know, um, yeah. Yeah. The Glen Karen advertisement. <laughs> Ching! Yeah. So we should get, we're totally going to get like Supple Life, uh, Glen Karen, <laughs> Whiskey, day. Whiskey uh, accessories. Yep. Yeah. We've been trying to find a bag maker to make like a leather like dang oh. dangle pouch. So you can always. Uh, <laughs> so you can do not... a whiskey dangle? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or get like clean canteen. To yeah. make a, a metal, oh, a metal, that's a good like idea. Karen. With the right shade, yeah, the right. aromas. Yeah. That's a good idea. Clean or if you, had a, if you had a pinion bike, you could have just like a Glen Karen <laughs> insert and like shove this. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Uh, well, we hope you guys you, uh, enjoyed this episode. If you want to learn more about Tumbleweed, uh, check out uh, the website. Thanks so much for coming, for yeah. bringing a, a nice whiskey. Uh, bonus points. And. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so until next time. Keep the supple side down. Cheers. Cheers.